want to start with saying in your lifetime, China is going to play this huge role as this economic superpower that, uh, let's just be honest, they will replace us, okay, as the superpower. Unless we get our act together and go green and beat them out, um, that's the only possibility I can think where we could keep up. So they will be demonized and they will, you know, all the politicians will just be frothing at the mouth about how awful the Chinese are, blah, blah. So don't pay any attention. Just remember that's one thing it's power and money but the chinese people could be uh are amazing they have an amazing culture they've had five thousand years of culture they have a heritage just unlike the u.s and their people are taught you know that the u.s is bar barbaric right it doesn't have an ancient culture. It's people are not disciplined. I mean, you can imagine the way we come across that the rhetoric is going to be very easy. It's going to be very easy to have a food fight <laughs> between the two countries. And so if you're educated, you should be able to see through all that stuff. And it doesn't take a lot of education. You just have to read a few books and think a few thoughts. And that's kind of it. You won't be a sucker. Uh, but okay, Melanie, what was, pick a point and we'll see how far that takes us. Um, okay, uh, I guess I'll start with <clears throat> one of my favorite analects of his were to be wealthy and honored in an unjust society is a, a disgrace. Um, and that was one of my favorites <clears throat> because I think it kind of embodies what's going on right now in society um, where we have a, a really, really powerful higher class or upper class and the middle class and lower class basically have no power at all and it makes up a really big part of our society <laughs> so only a few people right now not a few but only a small several people have a lot of power over um over america and i think that's where corruption comes in um to where they i don't know i mean <clears throat> a lot of the wealthy's beliefs and belief systems um, like can stay in America because of how much power they have. And so there's not a lot of minorities um, that can, I guess, feel comfortable living in society now. And yeah, I, I don't know, to me that comes off as like, you're using your power to corrupt society. And to me, that is a disgrace, so. The ruling for the sake of the ruled, right? Helping yeah. your family and friends and harming your enemies or everybody else. Yeah, we live in an oligarchy, the rule of the rich, right? Then the other question is how many of people, how many of the bottom 80% admire the rich or honor the rich, right? They honor each other. Well, yeah. But how many people that are the have nots actually admire these people? What do you think, Melanie? Um, <clears throat> I think that depends. I want to say not very many people admire them because I don't. Um, but I also think <clears throat> that's where maybe religion um, plays a big role. Uh, like people with a lot of money and a lot of power um, lean on God uh, a lot, I think, and say, they what, say what they God do. Wants. Yeah, this is what God wants. And then that's why our country is based off of Christianity right now, because they kind of just leave it to God and follow the people that are big on God. And yeah. Well, they say they do, right? It's a whitewash. Right. Okay. And that's where Confucius 
doesn't do that, right? Um, his view is the great harmony. So there's no God, right? There's no guy in the sky. Um, but then the ruler has a different way of making himself authoritarianism. So authoritarianism in each country functions differently, like the rhetoric is different, but the dynamic, you know, concentrating power among your friends and family is the same. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, Jack, what do you think? Um, for my favorite intellects? Yeah, we'll start with one and then we'll go to two and three and okay. see how that works. Um, when we see men of worth, we should think of equaling them. When we see men of contrary character, we should turn inwards and examine ourselves. Um, I think that's important because like, if you see somebody that is like, that you think is unworthy, I think you should like look inwards instead of condemning somebody else because that kind of assumes that you're perfect and you don't have any flaws. So I think that's, I think that's a good one. Don't judge. Yeah. Are Americans judgmental? Yeah, definitely. Well, that's because they're told God is judging them every day. So you know what I mean? Like they just project that guilt or they imitate that image of God and start, even though Jesus said not to do it, I think that's where it comes from. Does that make sense, Jack? Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. It, it's, so just FYI, the Hindus teach people not to judge also. I think because it's a, it's a poison, you know, it's a social poison to judge people. Yeah. Um, Melanie, did you have another one? Yes, my second one was never give a sword to a man who can't dance. <laughs> Very good. Um, so I don't, this just kind of made me think um, of politics as an example today. Like we, the sword being power, and then when if you can't dance, you can't really do anything with that power once you have it. So like, I think... A lot of times people that have power in our society today say that they're going to accomplish um, like so many things. And they tell you that to get the minorities and the poor on their side. And then once they have all of that power, they never really get anything done. They just relish in the power and use it to corrupt. Okay. So, but you do have to, you have to figure out why aren't they getting it done? Is it because they have the power to do what they said and they can't and they're not doing it? Or is it because the other party is obstructing them, right? Because the other party doesn't want them to do what they promised or people will, you know, or that party will lose out. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. And I, that's a whole, a whole other issue. To... Right. No, but that's important because the students really need to say why. Is it because they actually have the power to do this and, they, and they're not doing it? Or because they don't? They have to do stuff they don't want to do because otherwise they'll lose the election big time next time. Um, and that's... It makes a lot of difference, though, so you do have to be careful. Um, Jack, what's your second one? Um, he who offends against heaven has none to whom he can pray. Um, I think that's like if you're a religious person and you like swear or say bad things against your God, then it's not. I don't think that would reflect very good on you. I don't think you would get very good karma. <laughs> Jesus, you know, you're not supposed to curse at all, right? Um, okay. And Melanie, what's your third one? When the wind blows, the grass bends. 
Uh, I just like that one because I feel like um, kind of like with my parents' generation, uh, like went on specifically on my mom's side, like the world has changed a lot, you know, with um, LGBTQ and racism and just everything that's evolved. And they had a choice whether or not they could move with the world and evolve with the world. And they chose not to. And so they're kind of still just stuck in their ways. And I think this analect is a reminder that the world's going to continue changing. And that can that can go even with just your personal life. And you have to decide whether or not you conform to that and move with it. Or if you're going to stay stuck in your ways and try to stay living in a world that doesn't exist anymore. It'll be literal, too, because the wind is going to blow harder and harder, right? Uh, climate disruption is going to be a literal example. There's an old proverb about the oak tree and the grass. Did you ever hear that one? The oak tree thought it was so great. You know, it's tall and all that. And the grass is like, what are you? Nothing. And then the wind blows <laughs> and the tree goes down and the grass is just fine, you know because it didn't get so full of itself and because it could bend with the wind. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. It is interesting, these legends, these stories that are very similar will come up. They'll just pop up pretty much out of the human condition. You know, it's not because they had heard this story from China or something. They just looked around and made, made a story out of it, a fable, right? Um, Jack. Um, my last one was the superior man thinks of virtue, the small man thinks of comfort. Okay. I think, I think, um, like a good person would be like someone that wants to look for virtuous things to do in their life. And like, um, just an average person would just think of how they can get by and live comfortably and just kind of do leisurely things in their life and not really accomplish anything. I think that's yeah. kind of a waste. Yeah, I have a student and I, I think that's true. Like you're gonna get to midlife and say, well, what am I living for, right? Yeah. I mean, I have a nephew and his parents just, he didn't have a high IQ, right? Oh my God, how is he gonna make money? So they went the tutoring and the private schools and blah, blah. And he's, you know, got a BA because he got all this help. He got a, you know, a very high paying job. He, do, he helps rich people get richer. He's a financial advisor. Yeah. <clears throat> it's just like, okay, Andy, you're in midlife. His wife loves spending money. Really? You know, is that it? Yeah. Ever since he was tested in kindergarten, there's been this obsession with him being successful. Is he ever going to say, what the heck? <laughs> uh, you know, his wife is small minded. You know, money is everything. They're friends. You know, everything is related to that. And obviously they don't get along with a lot of the relatives, they never, you know, they're pretty far out. They live in Denver compared to a big network of the extended family in the Twin Cities. And I don't know. It's, shallow. it's just, what's the point? That isn't what life's about. You know, it is yeah. kind of crazy. Um, that's where some people have that kind of a life crisis. And they do want to seek meaning, but some just have, no, I want to, you know, be a teenager again and divorce my wife and marry a 20 year younger woman, you know, but the natural orientation is to say, okay, I got that stuff out of the way. I've now I can really start giving back or now I can be creative. I have time to do some right music or you know, engage with other people in these ways that aren't just driven by my need. And mm. I, it just makes so much sense to me. And I, I feel like 
so many Americans are deprived even of the idea of what midlife is about. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it is spooky, but that's, that's a humanist model is that midlife, wow, now you can really try to be fully human. Um, all right, so let's go to, um, let me start out with um, any other comments? Well, what about your comment? Well, let's, uh, the outline about, okay, so the main thing about Confucius is he grew up with the warring states, civilization had collapsed. He considered, you know, the realist, the all you need is love, the founding father's reason. He chose deliberate tradition. Now, our founding fathers chose reason, but they wanted it to be supplemented with Confucius or something like Confucius, right? Virtue clubs. So starting with Melanie, what did you think of this article? Do you remember some part of it that you liked that, that surprised you? Um, I read this a couple days ago, so one second. I, something that stood out to me about Confucius was, um, like, where he said, all you need is love. That's um, that, Maoist. Yeah, that's just, that's one thing that I don't agree with. Well, that said. Confucius didn't agree with that. That okay. was the other side. There were the realists, you use force, the Maoists, you use love. The founding fathers you use reason, and Confucius you use deliberate tradition. So, what about our founding fathers? The article. Mm, you you have to give me a second. I can't remember this one. Okay, it was eight pages long. It was under today's reading. It was the main reading reading for today. Um, well, let's start with Jack. What did you think? I didn't get to this one as well. Oh, because I didn't assign a lot of reading. I guess I signed a lot for last time, right? The chapter in the Houston Smith book. Mm. Did you finish the chapter in Houston Smith? Yes, ma'am. Okay, did you finish it, Melanie? Yeah, yeah, I finished it last before last time. Okay, so, well... I, don't, I do want to start next, next class with your reactions, because when I read this, I was surprised. I mean, I know that Americans need to supplement their rugged individualism with some respect for relationships, you know? It's killing us. But to think that the founding fathers knew that, and um, they were worried about... Um, using the law as a tool of oppression. They were worried about inequality and in wealth, right? Because there weren't, they didn't have a king. They don't have that kind of corruption. They didn't have an aristocratic class that inherited their estates and that inherited the house of nobles. They inherited political position. They got rid of that. But now America's weakness would be wealth that everybody, people have more economic opportunity. They have a chance to go up in the social ladder, but money can stick to money and form another uh, entrenched wealthy class. So now the wealthy have to be trained to want to be moderate and generous. And at, excuse me, Adam Smith said that Aristotle said that they know this stuff, but they wanted Confucius because they wanted, you know, people to learn how to think outside of any of the boxes they grew up with. It's the same virtues. Confucius says it, it doesn't matter, right? Um, the Chinese are enlightened by a benign religion, right? So they, just like you guys, you hear everybody says God this and God that, you know, 
And if you don't believe in God, you're going to be wicked or people are saying God wants Trump or I believe God wants, I mean, you can use that word God and it gets so corrupt. So Thomas Jefferson said, yeah, it's this, it's a religion, but it's the great harmony. You know, it doesn't have this personification where you project yourself into God and you're just basically making yourself God. So he understood this. He also had a Quran in his library, incidentally. He had, you know, he was a cosmopolitan. Um, he also owned slaves, so yeah. Um, Benjamin Franklin, he published excerpts from Confucius. Can you imagine what would happen if, you know, a politician did that today on either side? Can you imagine how many people would go, oh my God, he's not patriotic. Oh my God, he's awful. Um, he created a party for virtue. Um, some people wanted, again, to form this privileged class, right? Um, and Benjamin Franklin, the whole thing was you have to prove yourself worthy, right? It has to be based on merit. You have to show that you could do it. Um, and then if you proved yourself worthy, then your parents would be honored, which means there's a there's reward system for having a family that gets along, you know, and having parents that model virtue for their kids. Good laws are not enough. Um, people have to have virtue and goodwill. This again is it's straight out of Aristotle, but straight out of Confucius also. Um, Thomas Paine, he saw the comparison between Confucius, Jesus, and Socrates. And I think he saw it because he also knew Aristotle and knew Aristotle's virtues. It's just our, you know, the historical record. We don't have everything they thought. And we don't have everything they wrote. We don't, we just have a tiny fraction. So you piece it together. Um, and that would, that's just a very natural inference. Um, virtue is our best security, right? Again, Aristotle said, if you've got a population that's greedy, they're going to have animosity with other countries. They're either going to have wars of aggression to get resources, wars for oil, which is the reason we went to into Iraq, excuse me, it was right there. The people who did it said that, but the politicians didn't say they said it. So we have wars for oil. Uh, Russia is totally corrupted by oil. Um, and then, or somebody will attack them to get their wealth, right? So if a country is arrogant and greedy, they're gonna have bad relationships with other countries. You're gonna have wars all the time. Okay, then the next part I had, uh, in addition to that article, there were some pages about emotional intelligence. Did you read this? Um, did either of one, one of you read this article? I did not. I thought the reading was just the, the analects book today. I read oh, all of the analects. Wait, Jack. I mean, it doesn't say that, right? It says, okay, what does this thing say? It says for March 8th, that's today, finish Confucius and read the attachments, right? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, I just, I can't figure out, you know, where's the disconnect? Um, so Melanie, did you read that? I mean, is how is it that, is it that I didn't say it in class and that's why you didn't get it? Or, I mean, it it's confusing to me that, because uh, in general, I'm not always conscientious, but I've tried to be, and especially since it's online, it's a little easier. I can keep, you know, I do try really conscientiously for today, we do this, for today, we do this. And um, 
if we didn't finish one day, we can do a little more, but you're always responsible for what it says, unless I say otherwise. So you didn't read any of this, Jack? No, ma'am. Okay, what about you, Melanie? Did you read any of this? Yeah, yeah, I read them. Okay, good. I um, just couldn't, sorry, I just couldn't um, remember my comments on this one because it had been a couple days. That's my fault. Oh, that's okay, Melanie. Can you remember them now? Um, yeah, actually, uh, as you started talking about it, I was going to comment on um, Benjamin Franklin. Okay. Um, I thought it was cool that he published excerpts from Confucius, but I thought it was interesting that he specifically said people must have virtue and goodwill towards each other and must trust each other because in, a, in one of the analects that I um, wrote for today, I mentioned empathy because we had talked about that last semester in um, uh, women's issues, how just having empathy for someone else and being able to try to understand their side can help you out so much when it comes to intelligence. And how can you govern people? You can't govern people if people are competitive, mean-spirited, you know, there's no number of laws that's ever going to get you to any kind of social order. Does that make sense? And yeah, that makes yeah, sense. And Confucius knew that, that section on good governance made that clear. So Jack, we can go back. And if you read all the analects, we'll go back on good governance and you can talk about that because there's plenty to talk about from the earlier part. Did you read the section on governing? Yes, ma'am. Good, that's great. Um, all right, so I don't know, Melanie, if you tell your conservative relatives that <laughs> Ben Franklin published excerpts from Confucius, what are they gonna say? Say that Dr. Beck is corrupting Melanie. <laughs> I don't know. Oh yeah, I'm sure they would argue with me. <laughs> Really, you know, it's just a fact, right? Uh, that's sad. It, yeah, it, it must be hard. Again, I admire my students. Um, let's see, let me go to, um, let me go then. Um, Jack, why don't you tell me what you would like to talk about from this, these readings? Did you wanna go to these quotes about governing? Yes, ma'am. Can you pull them up? I can't open. Sure. I can't open my Analex book on my phone right now. Or it'll okay. kick me out of Zoom. That's fine. So, do you remember we did that? We did the human being. I talked about that last time. Um, and then at fifteen, you know the stages of life, the Socratic thing. You don't think you know? I mean, don't you think it's amazing? Uh, the golden mean, my gosh, <laughs> how did he know? Um, let's see, propriety, that was about relationships. And that would be, you know, Jack, that might be the downside, the thing you don't like. It's just way too much deference uh, to other people. I think what I have, like, I don't know if I have a problem with this, is like always like, respecting your elders that's what kind of what it, the overarching theme that i got with confucius but i don't know if that's always a good thing right well i mean it's interesting because when it goes too far they can't make any progress right which is partly why they accept the emperor because he he mandates stuff and they move forward and so you don't you know the parents and the children will be on the same page, right? Um, whereas in our country, we have a more individualistic economy. And so each generation moves forward. Well, then they, but their parents hold them back, right? Does that make sense, Jack? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. So we wouldn't value that. This one is just a really interesting uh take on the golden mean right 
he does this, not too little, not too much, not too little, not too much. Um, then, uh, yeah, what do you wish for? Well, I'd share my stuff. And, you know, Confucius says it's all about quality of life. It's not about stuff. Um, he does want to remember antiquity. Remember, you have to keep this image of the Chinese character in mind so that you are really Chinese. Um, cultivation of character includes study. Um, let's see. Uh, what I wanted to do, and this is meant, you know, everything that we talked about last time with the way that he had deliberate tradition, how to rule. This is what Jack. So if you want to, um, comment on a, one or two or whatever of these that you that struck you Jack sorry I didn't unmute <laughs> oh uh, my favorite one is the wise man doesn't have an opinion for or against something he looks at the facts and then decides what's right. I think that's the best, the best way to rule. Right. I don't think a lot of people do that, especially in our society. Yes, and if you actually, I'll show you a newspaper article where they point that out, that that's a weakness for us. Um, let's see. All right, um, anything else, Jack? It will probably come to me. I don't have my my book up right now. Okay. What about you, Melanie? Um, I you scrolled by one that stuck out to me, and it was um, uh, hold on, let me go look. It was about how um, like he's always looking for knowledge. He's always searching for knowledge therein. Um. I don't know. I just think that's cool. I think it's cool how you can be under the impression that you're always still trying to learn something. You're always still trying to learn new things about the world and how it works. Um, and that's kind of how I try to live. I always try to have an open mind and be empathetic because, oh, there it is. It's G. It's I, okay. uh, I am not one who has innate knowledge, but one who loving antiquity is diligent in seeking it therein. So yeah, I try to live like that. I try to always keep an open mind, learn new things about everybody because everyone's mind is so unique. I just, I, don't, I think it's cool. Yeah, and when an uncultivated person comes to me with a question, I thrash it out, right? Um, so that would be empathy and that would be dialogue. Like you're always willing to have a dialogue. That's the opposite of polarization, right? Um, Good. All right. So this this part is when Melanie were talking was talking about, and Aristotle also talked about what's really important is trust and goodwill between people. So you have to have a quality of life, or else the laws are just Aristotle says if you don't have political community, if people aren't bound together by choice as a part of their character strength because they're citizens living under a body of laws, even though they don't know each other personally. If you don't have that basic foundation, then all the laws are, are these um, guardrails to prevent bad people from harming each other. And that's not a political community at all, Aristotle says. And that's a lot like what Confucius says, right? If you govern people just by fear and threats, I'll throw them into prison, throw away the key, right? They'll just try to avoid penalties and they won't have shame. This is what we're doing, right? We have a war on drugs, we have a war on this, and we try to use more and more fear and force and bigger prison sentences. It doesn't work. And then the politicians themselves are corrupt it doesn't work, right? Nobody, there's no respect there. 
Um, if he works for his own interest, he'll arouse animosity. Um, what, okay, I think, go ahead. Either one of you can interrupt me while I'm just scrolling. This is an important one. If you have to choose between food forces and confidence of the people, you can give up the forces and give up the food even because you've got to have confidence of the people or else you're going to have chaos. Um, what do you think? Does that make sense to you? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it'll be interesting what happens with the Ukrainians and the refugees because, you know, there's a spirit there of the people that are taking them in. And so they will endure lack of food because the basic spirit is that we're going to help you every way we can. But what if the people, you know, in these nearby countries really resented that they were coming, right? Well, even if you had food, it wouldn't. There would just be all this animosity. Um, okay. This one is super important. Number K, book, you know, page four. <laughs> What's important? The correction of terms. Um, if the terms are incorrect, this is language, right? If the rhetoric, if what the person says is false or manipulative, um, then statements do not accord with facts. When they do not accord with facts, business is not properly executed. When it's not executed, there's no order and harmony. When there's no order and harmony, justice is arbitrary. When justice is arbitrary, people are completely unstable. They don't know what to do. Um, whatever a wise man states, he can always define. And what he defines, he can carry into practice. He will on no account have anything remiss in his definitions. Everybody get that? <laughs> and of course, that's horrible in our country right now, right? Misinformation. And a lot of people say that's at the root of the polarization is the misinformation. Well, that's what Confucius said. Um, okay. And here, the culture one, I also think is interesting that a good leader should love poetry, music, and the arts, right? Because it, it forms their character and they care that it teaches them how to feel and it has feelings that are important and that are worth preserving. And it requires a certain level of stability and well being to let yourself have these emotions, let yourself create music, let yourself appreciate music. It stimulates, you know. So anyway, how many of our politicians do you think like poetry? Think Trump loved poetry? Do you, how many Americans think, you know, a good ruler should like the arts? People would think, what does that have to do with ruling? <laughs> All right, so let me go through these virtues quick. Um, just to remind you of you know, temperance, courage, generosity, Meg, even tempered ambition. He addressed powerful people. He didn't just sit at home. Um, he, he honored citizens, right? This wise person honors other people. It doesn't worry about being honored. He has humor. He has these friendships. He's very sociable, obviously. He's truthful. Um, He's moderate in his material possessions. He makes laws um, and rules that always develop rule for the sake of the rule, distribution of wealth, rectification of wrongs. You always have to maintain the trust of the people and do it for the well being of the people, how you apply the laws. Um, he knows the object of wish is human flourishing. He knows how to deliberate. So they have stories about Confucius talking to his, his friends and he understands their character. He knows what to say to them. And then um, the 
the intellectual virtues are the ones that you think this is what college is about, you know, getting your left brain going, math, science, analyzing stuff, uh, just constantly analyzing stuff. And you can go on Saturday night and be any kind of person you want, but you can be really a straight A student. That's not, you know, traditional liberal arts education. So, okay. And it's not what Confucianism was about either. So here's the news. And I, I think this is um, interesting. It's just over the years, because I've taught this so many years, I find these articles, you know, that relate to the reading. So even though I use the same book, it's not like you have to blow the dust off. It's always, I'm always adding to it. Um, but this is the one about at each stage, at 40, you start getting integrity, right? You don't have to struggle within so much. And gradually you become more and more mellow and more and more integrated if you lived a good life. Okay, then there, these are just some of my favorites. Ha, okay. So this is, um, what is it about exceptional employees? This guy makes millions of bucks, right? How come? because he was able to take all these insights and put a different name on them, put some pretty wrapping paper on them and sell them to the public. And it's interesting because it's really the advice, the wise advice is about the equivalent of somebody finding some magazine on the rack when they're waiting in line that says, if you wanna lose weight, you should eat less sugar and more vegetables. Oh my God, I gotta buy that magazine. <laughs> just, your mother told you that in kindergarten. But it's just people just keep forgetting or remembering or they think that somehow they'll do it if they keep reading it one more time. These people make so much money off of them. Anyway, yes, delay gratification, duh, I guess so tolerate conflict right the mean between extremes they don't seek conflict but they don't run away from it that's courage right um they focus <laughs> oh my gosh so um so yes that's common sense and houston smith said this why how did confucius have so much influence everything he says is just like what your mother told you in first grade uh we forget they're judiciously courageous how's that that just sounds like the mean between extremes uh for courage right speak up um have the courage to speak out this is Jesus, Socrates. They did it when it was, the stakes were really high. Um, they're in control of their egos, right? You're living for the sake of the well-being of the ruled. It's not about you. It's not about your ego. Um, you're never satisfied. Sounds like Confucius. Sounds like Socrates. Um, they recognize when things are broken. So you don't deny. You, don't, you aren't deluded. Um, you're honest, intellectually honest, morally honest. Um, you're accountable, right? Why did you do that? Um, don't blame other people. Take responsibility as much as you possibly can. You're marketable, which means you're likable, right? People like you, that's sociability. You neutralize toxic people. That would be another kind of social sociability, right? Um, and this just sounds like what Confucius did. Um, let's see, bringing it all together. All right, so that was, this guy is making millions of bucks. <laughs> He's the latest wisdom guru. Every five years or so, there's another one that comes up and, uh, eight seven habits of highly successful people that guy made a lot of money for a while and then the next one comes along and okay then there's george washington's rules of civility you know if somebody reads this and 
and just thinks, well, this is why America is so great, or this is why our founding fathers, we want, we ought to honor them. I mean, really, he's not the only one. And and he knew he's not the only one, you know? He wouldn't claim to be. Now, here's, here's the um, application today, what's going on in China. And I think this is really interesting. And I really think you need to think about this because you should know, I think you know, you are going to college at a time where for the last four years or so has been this rise in authoritarianism all over the world, right? The US has had a centralization of power in the executive branch. The Bush, Bush administration structured that in and it's gotten worse under Trump. He broke a lot of norms. He's really testing the envelope for how much power a president can have. The Republican Party has no party platform now. They just say it's whatever Trump wants. Well, the party used to have a platform, right? It used to have policies that they were accountable to. And they just, nope, whatever Trump wants. Okay, whatever. So, and the same is true in China. The emperor he's taken over. Same is true in Russia. Same is true in Hungary. Same is true in Poland. Same is true in um Syria, it's, um, it's a huge wave and it's the opposite of the 60s when there was a, or and also at the end of the Cold War, there was a wave that way and now there's a wave this way. And this is really important historically and your lives are touched by this, okay? Your lives are touched by climate change and they're touched by where you are on this continuum. Um, so I was born in the 50s, a time of prosperity and optimism. And then I went through teenage years when it had gone too far. And there was a lot of questioning that we had corrupted our opportunities. My kids were born. Um, my, my oldest daughter was born after the wall came down and there was all this optimism. And I remember when she was eight years old, I thought, oh my gosh, she's not gonna grow up with all that Cold War stuff, the communists, you know? She's not gonna have all that stuff. And then my son grew up after Bush took over and started charter school movement. My son ended up being a charter school. Okay, so my daughter grew up when there was this huge move, international development. And that's what she went into professionally. My son grew up, Bush started charter schools. That's what he's gone into professionally. And my youngest daughter was born right um, in the 80s. And then she came of age um, right when 9-11 happened. And that's when Fox News and all that. So she, she's a journalist. So I'm not sure if they're conscious of that. It was just what seemed like their calling, right? What they could do, what they enjoyed doing and what the society needed. So I think it's interesting, right? Um, so that's why this stuff is important is that there is this movement toward authoritarianism and that might affect, you know, what you start thinking your calling is, the, what you can use your talents to, to solve a problem out there or to cure, you know, deal with some spiritual disease in the society. So the way you make those judgments, conscious or not, like my job is to tell you it's within this historical context. And so what happened is um, I actually went to China in 2010 and I went to Russia right around 2010. And that was right when they were opening up. And they were having lots of scholars come and they were going to be more democratic. And then all of a sudden, you know, it went the other way. And I will not go to Russia or China anytime soon because now if I go, I am helping these authoritarian leaders cover up and whitewash, right? Their anti democratic spirit. You, sure, bring in some scholars, free and open, 
discussion, no problem, as long as they're, they're part of the whitewash, as long as they don't say anything nasty or it doesn't get much traction. Sure, it makes you look good. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going there. <laughs> But I have colleagues that don't think it's important, and I, I do. But anyway, here's another thing that's important. As these authoritarian, all of them are very similar. They're going to make China great again, just like Confucius did, remember? It's amazing, right? He's just appealing to that same psychic desire to believe that we are truly great and we were great, OK? Make China great again. Putin is going to make Russia great again. That's why he invaded Ukraine. That's why he invaded the two other countries, um, uh, Chechnya, I think. I can't remember. But yeah, he's been trying to get back the Soviet Union like it used to be in the good old days, right? And it works. Uh, there was an interview with Mr. McFall. Uh, who has been a diplomat to Russia, he was for decades, and he said, in the minds of the Russians, uh, whatever Putin does is fine. The Ukrainians are terrorists, and you can go in there and do what they're doing. They don't even know what they're doing, right? The propaganda, the whitewash is huge. And, but the, the real, you know, the take, the desire is to make Russia great again, make China great again. And of course, in the US, obviously, mega, make America great again. And it doesn't work, right? It only prevents us from going green. It prevents us from adapting. And but it but in China's case, it it won't, I don't think, because he'll just decide to go green and the whole country will change. It'll change because it was mandated to change. Um, all right, so the other thing I wanted to point out was, um, okay, and I have another article farther down. All they do, you know, on the media, they just point to the corruption and failings in the Western democracies. And why would we don't question communism because the alternative is chaos and corruption. And so it's very convincing to a Chinese person to follow what the emperor says. Does, does that make sense to you, Jack? When uh, the way we're projected is just chaos and corruption? Yeah, but I don't, I think like it's easy to use propaganda to like paint us in that light because we don't have like a centralized culture but I definitely think we do have a culture. But they're not going to know, right? And yeah. the thing is, they have a culture too. That's what I wanted to point out, right? Mm -hmm. um, that they have lifted more people out of poverty um, than any other nation in, in history, right? I think the equivalent of, I think, you know, there's 330 million people in the US. I think they've lifted twice that many people out of severe poverty. Well, if that's true, you know, you're going to follow the party that lifted you out of poverty, right? And you are going to think that they're ruling for the well being of the ruled. Um, and it does have a lot to do with the one child policy. And if the one child policy is what enabled them not to worry about if they're going to get any food tomorrow, they're willing to go with it, right? Does that make sense? I mean, I think an American would too, if they were in that situation, they would sell out. They would, uh, who needs freedom? I need food. <laughs> Does that make sense, uh, Melanie? Yes, that makes sense. Okay. All right. The next thing is in the propaganda, he's referred to, he uses a reverent Chinese word for a leader that was also used for Mao, but also, of course, he's referring back to Confucius. So the whole culture had Confucius, 
sitting with his book, right? So just like Buddhism has Buddha meditating, China has Confucius sitting there with his book, the scholar who's always learning. <laughs> you guys, these people are going to wipe us out. <laughs> emphasizing learning, emphasizing acting on facts. Ah, like that was us. We were the ones that were going to do that, right? Our founders, we were going to be the fact base, not the divine right of kings and all that garbage, right? And I don't like, I don't want us to become like China because you know what happens to philosophers in China. That's why I wish people would get their act together. We're going to, we're going to lose it, guys. And the philosophers are going to be the first to go. Anyway, um, Okay, so the point there is that you can use all those quotes from Confucius that we just read, and you can, you know, it's it's a no-brainer that the propaganda would quote from those quotes and say, well, that's what the ruler is, right? He cares about the trust and goodwill, and he's always ruling for the sake of the ruled. Um, now, Mao criticized Confucius because that was the people exploiting the proletariat. And but now he regularly quotes Confucius and the ancients, their teachings. Um, all right, so let me just pause for a minute. Now that we've read some of the stuff from Confucius about good governance, does it make sense to you that the ruler now would be quoting from that and saying, we have to make China great again. Jack. Yeah, I think he's appealing to antiquity there. They like have a 5,000 year tradition, you know, by comparison, we're just a bunch of barbarians. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. What about you, Melody? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think they, really try to stay away from corruption that makes sense like keep the peace well i mean there's corruption at the top but overall they they have a middle class and they keep growing the middle class so even if people want to criticize the russians and the chinese for a long time until recently, and this is not true anymore with Putin and his buddies, very few people are super, super rich. But for a long time, uh, they overthrew the czars because the serfs had nothing, treated like absolute dirt. So the communists did raise them up. I mean, it killed off a whole bunch of people. Stalin killed off a whole bunch of people. And that wasn't the original idea. And all the original communists were condemning Stalin. But if you just look at distribution of wealth, if you just look at whether the middle class is growing or shrinking, in both cases, but especially China, they grew the middle class. So in the US, we're shrinking the middle class. And you can say it's partly because we had a, a very high level. Well, okay, it's just that that's what destabilizes a country. And that's what makes people want to find a strong man who will fix it for them. In China, because they're growing the middle class, the strong man could say, keep me in power because I obviously rule for the ruled. Um, so mostly it's just, if you were over there and you were Chinese, you would buy in, I think, even if you had, it wasn't all propaganda, right? You found out about the US, you would just choose China because you would see China works better. Um, in Russia, it's, it's worse. Uh, that's, that's another issue. Russia and China are very different. And the reason they had revolutions is because there was no middle class. And finally, the poor just revolted. Um, but in those revolutions, the Chinese, first of all, um, brought in capitalism and kept their control of the culture, whereas the Russians opened up the culture first. And when they, with the economy, a very few people took over the businesses, 
and the oil and stuff. So they had a very centralized economic system. They have very few very rich people who all depend upon Putin to have their power. So Putin has them wrapped around his finger. And so that's different. They started out with the cultural opening up and then tried to do the economic equality. That has not worked. Whereas China has started out with economic, bringing the capitalists, but keep the authoritarianism, which means keep the taxes high, control the distribution, control a lot of other things. And that's working better to strengthen the middle class. And you can say anything you want, but a lot of people really care about whether the middle class is shrinking or not. They can think they believe other things, but if they get desperate, all those bets are off. Okay, now. Is, is that not just because they have a lot of people that were super impoverished and they're just coming up to the middle class? Right, it's relative, but that is, you know, Political stability has to do with people's standard of living relative to what it was or what their parents were or what the grandparents were. Does that make sense, Jack? Yes, ma'am. It's another reason why we shouldn't allow these changes to destabilize us because none of us are starving. Um, but because of capitalism, so many people are getting into debt, right? And they wanna keep up with the Joneses, I mean, it's a mess. I really think, here's my advice to you, always distinguish between what you need and what you want and get your needs met. Don't have too many wants because if you start destabilizing yourself, like borrowing money because of what you want, or if you can't trust your judgment, you destabilize yourself, right? And also you, you create these bubbles and bursts in the community when people get way into debt and then everything crashes. And then, you know, it's bad for the society and it's bad for the individual. And that's by choice. You know, you don't have to buy that big a house or that expensive a car. You don't have to buy all this stuff. And so it's really disappointing that Americans by choice have destabilized themselves to some extent. And then there was an inevitable decline of our middle class because we don't have two thirds of the world market anymore. So it's this combination that we were gonna have a shrinking middle class, manufacturing jobs, plus people destabilize themselves. All right, now this is interesting. Um, so, Here's another era of strongmen. So we live in an era of strongmen. Putin, Egypt, Turkey. And I'm not a I'm not a news junkie. Like you can just follow the news. I don't know. I follow it half an hour a day or maybe 40 minutes. But just to get the general idea, I think it's good for you to, to be aware. You're stepping into history at this point. Um, authoritarian reversion. Now, the way Putin is behaving is very interesting because we're all the democracies are coming together and they're unifying in a way that they weren't before. So once again, we're having this really, you know, feeling our way in terms of democracy versus authoritarianism. So, so that's interesting. Um, Expanding political, okay, there was this, after the wall came down, expanding freedoms and people's expectations didn't get met. And so power hungry people said, if you vote for me, I'll make it all better. Um, but globalization, rising in the, all this stuff is disorienting people. Um, let's see, he's the only person who can, okay. So what I wanna get to, this is another thing that's interesting. I still have six minutes, but I would like you to read these because they're all interesting. So this one is, a, is his argument for what the, the government in China should be. So I do think we're not just moving toward 
a one size fits all democracy. We have a lot of different versions of democracy. Some of them you'll say that's not really democracy, but that's you got to read it, you got to understand it. So, uh, okay, uh, political Confucians defend this approach, the way of humane authority, right? Rule for the sake of the ruled. There's the legitimacy of heaven and natural morality. That's the great harmony. The legitimacy of earth, that's history and culture. And the legitimacy of the human, the human, which is you get political obedience through popular will, right? That's where you gain the trust of the people. And he's saying this after he knows the Analects really well. So you could, after you've read the Analects, you can understand where he's coming from. This is the article I wanted to really get to because uh, eight ideas behind China's success. I mean, this to me is pouring acid in the wound. Like he knows exactly what our weaknesses are. And here are the arguments. We're better than you because we seek the truth from facts, not ideological dogmas like freedom, freedom, you know. Okay, good point. The primacy of people's livelihood. It doesn't matter if the rulers have power. What matters is they get rid of poverty. Good point, <laughs> all right? The importance of holistic thinking, a pattern of priorities and sequences. Like these guys plan ahead, whereas, you know, we keep switching, you know, and the politicians gain votes from being anti this one. And so, of course, our policies change all the time and they, they undermine each other. You can't plan anything. Good point. <laughs> Government is a necessary virtue. It's, and that's Aristotle, political association. We are social and political by nature, right? Good point. <laughs> uh, good governance matters more than democracy. So what matters is rule for the sake of the rule, not if you know people elect their rulers because Americans elect their rulers, but they elect rulers that don't give a damn about them and they corrupt their power just because they have this rhetoric. So Americans, you know, they'll vote for somebody because he lets them have guns and they don't notice that he's shrinking the middle class. Or they'll vote for somebody because he doesn't believe in abortion. He won't notice there's going to be more abortions because you shrunk the middle class, right? So actually governing in a way that promotes the middle class is more important than just if you got to elect your leaders or not. Performance legitimacy, like you're accountable, right? It's a meritocracy. People show that they can do the job, then they're given the job. Now, this, of course, idealizes what goes on. <laughs> Selective learning and adaptation. Um, learning from others is prized. Obviously, if you read Confucius Analects, you know, this is something that culturally they value. Harmony and diversity. All right. Now, this, of course, one of the, the way they oppress the one million Wuhan, the Muslims, right? And so, okay, whatever. Um, but, but they'll say, yeah, but Americans are racist too. Look what they do, blah, blah. So yeah, racism is an issue. Um, okay, so yes, we have our problems um, and we'll learn from the West, but we're not just want to be westerners we don't just we don't put you on a pedestal we have our own culture and our own way of having a flourishing society now that's a good point um it's just that i do have one other point there's a guy named mark meadows who was a major advisor to trump and one time he actually said what democracy isn't what matters Human flourishing is what matters. And so he was trying to get people used to the idea that Trump is breaking all these norms, but that's okay as long as he rules for the sake of the rule. Now, I, I just flipped out because I know he's referring to Aristotle because he knows that stuff because he's conservative. Um, but Aristotle would never say that America 
should not have a democracy. He would say that there are reasons China should not because of their history and their culture in order to flourish, right? He could agree with the, the guy in this article, but America was founded. It is the country in, in world history that ought to be able to stay a democracy because of the, well, you know, you just knocked off a few Native Americans and nobody's fighting over land which was a huge issue, right? People would inherit their land and then they'd have an advantage right away. So uh, I'm, Aristotle would say America was designed for democracy and if they lose it, that's on them. Like that's huge corruption because there's no way they ought to lose a strong and stable middle class. They're losing it for exactly the reason everybody loses it, which is greed. And they don't even care. <laughs> they think they're so exceptional that they even think greed is good. When history shows that is the political evil. It's the thing that will destroy any society. And the Chinese guy says, it's not that some of our top leaders don't have money, but they don't have a, that much money. They don't buy mansions and yachts and all that garbage. And they, um, and we do not value greed, right? We value humane values. And, and you know, this Chinese guy might say, that's why we're going to win. In 20, 30 years, we're going to mop the floor with you guys because you don't get it. You don't get the greed is a poison um, in your society. And we get it. And we're going to move forward. I don't know. That scares the heebie-jeebies out of me. Right, but I think it's a powerful argument.